I'm very conscious I am not uh, a language specialist. Um, and so I'll probably learn quite a lot in the rest of the day. And I guess a lot of what I'm going to say will be quite um, general or abstract or maybe slightly theoretical or medium term rather than being um, practical or short term or um, very specific. And that's partly because, uh, well, I'm not a language specialist, and partly because I've been doing something about learning with mobiles for over 20 years, and partly because I work in a variety of different contexts. Um, so I often work in Africa, and sometimes in China, and a lot in the Middle East, and so I ought to apologize for not speaking German, but I also have to apologize on other occasions for not speaking Swahili, or not speaking <laughs> Afrikaans, or not speaking Arabic, um, or not speaking French or Swedish. Um, hopefully the, the notes you've got will give you some idea of what I thought I was going to say. So now I have to stick to my script, um, which means I have to read some of it. I am a language learner, actually. Um, I'm learning, I now live in Wales, so I'm learning Welsh, which is the most difficult language. It's uh, utterly impossible. Um, but I suppose I think actually that um, learning language is actually the core of education and whilst you see language learning as learning to speak like a French person or learning to speak uh, like an Arab I think what education does is teach people to speak like a physicist or to speak like uh, a lawyer language is the way we enter communities and sometimes those are communities of different countries, but sometimes those are the communities of different professions and different crafts and different disciplines. So I think in many respects the challenges of language are the challenges of education. They are about comprehension, understanding, uh, speaking, listening, writing, just that sometimes they are writing in Italian, sometimes they are writing in physics, but it is still the same underlying um, challenge. And I think my point now really is that our societies are so fundamentally digital, that digital technology is so pervasive, ubiquitous, universal, and intrusive um, that there's a very strong dynamic between technology, society, language and learning. Um, and I think it's a mistake to see technology as uh, dumb or inert or passive. Uh, a mistake to think language or knowledge or information are just contained in technology and transmitted through technology, uh, transmitted unchanged. I think they are changed. I think the technology creates new genres, new vocabulary, new social contexts in which language happens. Um, so it's not um, additional, it's not a, a bolt-on. Uh, our societies are digital, mobile, connected societies. Uh, and it's almost, for, for, for people younger than me, or maybe younger than you, this is utterly unremarkable. Not worth mentioning. Um, uh, but maybe for people in institutions, because institutions change very slowly, whilst technology and people change very rapidly, this is still a surprise. Um, 
And a lot of my work, um, maybe in the first decade of mobile learning, was trying to understand how the technology would enhance or extend or enrich conventional education. How we could basically do the same thing, but better, bigger, wider, for more people, more communities, more countries. Um, but basically still the same institutions, schools, colleges, universities, still the same professions, lecturers, designers, um, still the same curricula, but just using the technology to amplify it. And I suppose over the last five or seven or eight years, I, I think that is quite uh, backward looking, quite inward looking. Um, and actually when I have conversations with, um, sorry, do you say rectors, directors, vice chancellors, university senior officials, about the need to become more digital. Um, my argument is not about evidence from research, it's about evidence from looking out of the window. Um, and even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we had school kids saying they came to school and they powered down. They had five devices in their bedrooms, they came to school, they had one, it was a desktop computer. Um, so that is kind of the tension I see between um, formal, institutional, historical um, learning with technology and um, forward looking into a, into a society that is, as I say, digital and, and connected and mobile. Um, and I suppose my second point is that, again, technologies are not, not dumb or neutral. Um, they engage and they interact with language and with learning and with language learning, but they're also not neutral in the sense of being culturally neutral or linguistically neutral. They disturb the balance between different languages and different countries um, and different communities and different cultures because they represent and embody the language and or languages and values um, of some communities and not others, or more of some communities and less of others. Because we're talking about technologies which are designed by American technologists, which are manufactured in China, which are marketed by global corporations, and which are supported by national governments. Um, and so if, for example, um, I, I work in uh, Namibia with the SAN, is that, uh, the Bushmen? Yeah, okay. So they have a gestural language. Um, they don't have a word for yesterday and tomorrow. They point at the east. <laughs> uh, they point at the east for tomorrow. They point at the west for yesterday. Um, but we have a technology that is gestural because we have uh, uh, haptic interfaces. Um, but those haptic interfaces have the gestures of Steve Jobs, uh, not of the SAN community pointing to the sun as it rises and sets. Um, and there are lots of other ways in which this happens. Um, uh, we have autocorrect, which pushes us in, in direction of using some words and not others. So my stepson, his name is Robbie. If I type in Robbie, it capitalizes the R. 
if I type in my name, John, it doesn't capitalize it because John is American for toilet. Um, um, I work in the Middle East, and in the Middle East, many people are bilingual and um, talk Arabic, or oh, can write Arabic or can write English. But if you're using SMS, you get twice as many words in English as you do in Arabic because the English is represented by ASCII um, and Arabic is represented by Unicode, which takes more bytes or bits. So it, it encourages people or forces people to work in English less than Arabic. Um, I work in Hong Kong sometimes and in Singapore with Chinese populations and the Chinese have a uh, graphic representation, a, 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 um, they have ideograms, they have characters, they don't have letters. Well, they couldn't represent their language on a mobile phone until you had a graphic interface. They only had a uh, Roman, Latin, a Latin keyboard. So again, that alters the balance of who is empowered and who is disempowered uh, by the technology, by the values of the culture and the communities that they, they represent. Um, and you also see this happening um, in indigenous communities where um, different communities like uh, the Tuva in Siberia um, could see their language threatened because of, uh, do you call it globalish? Global English, threatened by the uh, information superhighway, by the um, global knowledge economy taking place in US English. Um, I, I speak British English, and that is now a minority threatened language as well. Um, and the, for example, the Tuva saw their language threatened because of um, the dominance of US English, um, and, and they're not unusual, they're not unique. Uh, Africa has 400 languages, 200 of them are threatened, um, and you see a tension in communities between do we move into the English-speaking global economy or do we preserve our culture and our language? Um, and the Tuva were lucky. Uh, they have a, a diaspora, they have um, expatriates in the US, who produced a Tuvan dictionary on an iPhone. And that preserves their language. I mean, maybe it freezes it or fossilizes it, but it preserves it. But other languages, not necessarily. Um, so, um, in that way, mobile technology, technology empowers and disempowers, it enhances and it, it threatens. And you also see the emergence of new dialects or languages. So for example, in South Africa, you see the emergence of uh, Mixlish. Mm -hmm. uh, and Mixit is a digital platform in South Africa that has thousands of kids uh, using it. And, um, what has grown up is Mixlish, which is English, uh, Shwana, Zulu, mixed together as a unique language. But South Africa has um, 10 or 11 official languages, and Mixlish is not an official language. Um, but last April, did you have April Fools? Yeah. Uh, uh, last April the 1st, there was a, a spoof, a joke, to try and get Mixlish established as South Africa's 12th official language. And okay, it was a joke, but actually this language embodies the communication, the values, the social relationships of thousands of kids. M maybe it should be the official language, but it is a product of the dynamic between a community and the technology. Sorry, I've just realised none of that was on my notes. Um, I'll, I'll start the presentation now. Shall I? Um, yeah, so I'm struck by... Um, whoops. 
Is it switched on? Sorry. Yeah. No, is it? Ah, wrong way around. Sorry, I had it upside down. <laughs> um, technology. There you go. Um, what I'm struck by is how the technology, as it becomes more popular, universal, as people become familiar and confident, is empowering people to create their own learning, to become each other's teachers, um, teachers of language, for example. Uh, and you can see that, for example, in podcasts. So this represents my f completely futile attempts to learn Arabic. Um, but you just download it. Um, download it onto anything, almost. And the interesting thing is, all of these podcasts, iTunes has millions of podcasts, all of these podcasts, no, most of these podcasts are not produced by ministries or universities, they are produced by individuals. Some of them are brilliant, some of them are awful, um, some of them might tell you the world is flat, um, but they represent a shift of agency and control, uh, control of how people learn and understand Arabic, what constitutes Arabic, maybe, um, from official sources, maybe the uh, Académie Française, to someone in their bedroom in Paris that wants to do a podcast to share. Um, and you also see people learning, sorry, this just shows my slightly odd hobbies, Byzantine history, learning Arabic, you name it. Um, yeah, the number of Facebook groups where, okay, podcasts are maybe learning through content. Special interest groups or interest groups in Facebook are a way of learning through discussion. So I'm making the point maybe that these new technologies support different pedagogic models. So this might be behaviorist or transmissive. This might be uh, discursive or social constructivist. Um, but again, you see people learning this way through discussions about everything. Um, and obviously you see an enormous variety of um, apps. Again, apps for learning language. Uh, there are five, seven, ten apps for learning Welsh. And Welsh is not a popular language. Um, and if you look at Arabic, there are many, 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 many more. And again, these are not necessarily produced by uh, corporations or uh, governments or ministries. They are produced by, uh, and they're also not produced by, by people wanting to make money. Producing apps is not a good way to get rich, not through iTunes and not through Apple. Um, but it represents, um, well, it, people want to say it represents a more democratic form of learning um, that's outside the control of the institutions. I don't think that's right because it's in the control of Google or Apple. It's just different control. Um, and sorry, these are some examples of um, language apps. Um, I, I sometimes work with um, Native Americans, so there are many, many different communities that have language apps being developed within those uh, communities. I recently read a paper that talks about zombie linguistics. Um, this looks like a really good thing. This is, you know, this is okay, this is what we like. But the, the paper was pointing out that maybe this is just preserving languages that ought to be dead. Uh, you know, maybe this is just like Gothic. Um, um, so, um, yeah, there's always more than two sides to an argument. Yeah, so this is um, Duolingo. Uh, this is my Welsh lesson. Uh, I'm, I'm now stuck on the past tense. It's terrible. <laughs> um, 
don't ever try in Welsh. Um, but it illustrates, again, I think that the technology is provided by a commercial company, but the content is provided by enthusiasts, people that want to promote Welsh. And actually, um, it just so happens that it's people that want to promote the Welsh dialect from North Wales, not the Welsh dialect from South Wales. So again, you can see how the technology is, is changing the balance there. And then there are all these other resources that allow people not just to learn in the sense of consume, um, but learn in the sense of contribute and discuss. And then there, of course, there is, there is YouTube, another resource that's presented as um, changing the production, ownership and distribution of uh, content allow and, um, and it's wonderful. Uh, I I, um, I went to Hong Kong for the first time some years back, and I, my suitcase is yellow, so it's very easy to find on the carousel. So I picked up a yellow suitcase, got in a taxi, rushed to my hotel room, found out I couldn't open the suitcase, and thought. I don't understand. So I went on YouTube and I found three different videos explaining how to pick the lock on uh, a suitcase. And yeah, so it's very educational. So I opened the suitcase and it was full of Chinese underwear. Um, I picked up the wrong suitcase. But uh, I've also learnt about crochet and um, about repairing my stove and about changing the pedals on my cycle and none of this is from, if you like, an official recognised institutional source. Um, and in fact, uh, we've had recent um, terrorist attacks in the UK and apparently if you now go on Amazon and select weed killer and sugar, you'll get a little line at the bottom saying people who bought these also bought ball bearings, nails. This is online terrorist shopping complete with back-end intelligence. Um, I think this has been closed down, but you can see how it is empowering all sorts of skills and people. Um, But you can also see the technology being used for translation. I, I work in Brazil with a project that's about Zika, and my taxi driver spoke Portuguese, spoke Brazilian Portuguese, I speak English. And we sit in the taxi where um, he speaks into his mobile, and there is a speech-to-text technology. He then presses Google Translate, and gets it into English, and then uses a text-to-speech technology so that I can listen to it. I then speak, it writes it as English text, he presses Google Translate, gets the Portuguese, presses another app which gives him the uh, spoken Portuguese version, and I wonder, why are we learning languages now? <laughs> um, and I, well, and I think the answer is probably obvious, but um, oh, sorry. this is very probably very English humour. But it's Douglas Adams' uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. Any, any recognition out there? Where he talks about uh, a future galaxy um, where people have access to the Babel fish. This is the ultimate performance support technology. You put it in your ear and it translates any language into your language. And so it's not that much different from Google Translate, really. Um, but it does beg the question, okay, if artificial intelligence, uh, mobile technology, processor, in, 
processor speed, uh, 4G, 5G coverage are available. Uh, why are we learning languages? Um, uh, I'll wait. That, that's but a question for discussion later, maybe. And, but I guess the reason we're learning languages is not for the vocabulary, or not for the syntax, and not for the grammar, but actually for the social context in which it happens. Um, okay, so those slides were really about um, the extent to which mobile personal technology, uh, connected mobile personal technology, empowers learners to become each other's teachers, uh, to learn from each other, to learn in a variety of different ways, to learn in a variety of different situations, um, but also how that technology changes the nature of language and that the nature of, of learning. Um, and of course, it's happening in the wider context, as I've said, of um, communities anywhere in the world which are increasingly uh, digital, connected, and mobile. And I suppose I'd argue this is having a, a much wider, more profound, maybe subtle um, effect on us and our cultures and our society and our language. I think there is um, a saying that some, something like we overemphasize the technological, the immediate technological impact, um, and we underestimate the long-term social impact. And I'm trying to talk more about the long-term social impact. But clearly what we see um, is a variety of ways in which the technology is making various artifacts, uh, modes, uh, genres uh, obsolete or at least transformed. Um, and with different communities it happens faster or slower. Um, some of us still read books, maybe most of us don't. I mean, I read a digital book most of the time. Uh, maybe young people don't read any kind of book uh, much of the time. Um, but the skills and the, maybe the prestige around the ownership and the understanding of books obviously changes. Um, and you can catalogue all of the different um, uh, functionalities which are now uh, folded into the mobile phone. The calendar, the clock, the camera, the music player, the TV, and on and on and on and on. Um, yeah, so this is an, an address book. Uh, this is a postcard. Again, a, a genre which is probably disappearing. It's becoming archaeology. Um, and the, the file facts. Now this was 20 years ago uh, this was a, a status symbol that expressed one's organisational status, one's social status. One was a busy, time-constrained um, executive that had a file of facts, that, that had so much to do and so many things going on that it needed this level of organisation. But who has a file of facts now? Um, so we see these different these different forms and formats disappearing, and we see new forms and new formats emerging. Um, so um, this might be one example, the emergence of the selfie. Now this is clearly a way people are, I don't know, validating themselves, maybe just being narcissistic. Um, I don't know, but it's clearly a powerful and popular um, Um, four, and, and, and there are obviously lots of others. I mean, you see the emergence, the, maybe the the decline of the essay and the rise of the blog. Um, and I suppose you can also see, to some extent, um, the the demise or the diminution of um, 
academic publishing in the face of the rise of Wikipedia. And I don't know if that's about the kind of democratization of, of um, academic thought. Um, and then if I wanted to make an argument about education, you know, why are people paying for education? One of the arguments is going to be that education is needed to service the economy. It's needed to put people into jobs. Um, but the economy is becoming increasingly digital. You know, the, uh, the transactions, the commodities, the artifacts um, at a, a national, international, um, personal, organisational level, these are all becoming increasingly digital. Uh, so, for example, if I was talking about the national level, um, in the UK, um, the government controls bandwidth. I think in most countries the government controls bandwidth. And the 4G bandwidth was auctioned. It was sold by the government to commercial companies. Um, and it was sold for billions of pounds. So suddenly it's like having oil. In the case of the UK, that's probably a good thing because we don't have any oil anymore. Um, so at a national level, there is now this new asset that's called bandwidth. Um, and you can look at this, as I say, at a variety of different levels. This is just a, quite an old picture. Um, I, I don't know if, if you have tasers in Germany. Do you have They're uh, uh, um, electric guns. Okay. So in the, in the United States, they are retail. So anyone could have a taser. Um, and a company marketed holsters for the Tazars. And because this is a mobile and digital community, they are MP3 enabled. So you can listen to music whilst you're... Uh, and they're obviously personalised, so um, leopard skin, red, which is very psychologically aggressive. Um, but the, the advertising slogan said, it puts the cute into electrocute. Um, but it's just one you know, obvious example of how the economy um, is becoming more digital, how the transactions in our jobs are, are changing. Uh, but also that our jobs are changing in the way that organisations need to change. You know, we used to have many jobs where um, individual workers um, maybe just the people who repair photocopiers had expertise and control. They would have uh, they would have their day, they could go to this customer, this customer, this customer, they could stop for a smoke, they could go to this customer, um, and they'd need to know stuff in order to repair a photocopier. But now they have a mobile device um, performance support tool which just gives them instructions, it says, look here, is this bit wrong, is this bit wrong, take this bit out, and it also knows where they are, how long they're taking, what they're doing. You know, so on the one hand, maybe it's very uh, benign, so for example, for ambulances or emergency workers, they have performance support tools that will help them do a diagnosis in the ambulance, and on the basis of the diagnosis, we'll direct the ambulance to the right hospital with the right specialist, and we'll transmit the information, uh, you know, uh, blood pressure, uh, photographs, to the, to the surgeon in advance. But on the other hand, maybe people who repair car engines or photocopiers no longer need skill, so it presses down the skill level, and that presses down the, um, the wage level. So again, uh, but of course, sorry, part of the reason for saying this is that, that obviously, if you like, in the UK, business English is, bus is big business. You know, a major segment of language teaching in the UK is English for, for business purposes. And these two slides are <coughs> illustrating the extent to which that business environment is changing. Um, 
and in many other respects um, as well. It's changing all sorts of social uh, patterns um, in which business takes place. Um, so there's a lot of um, work, I guess, by sociologists looking at how our interactions are being transformed by um, business. So, um, one example, uh, there's a, I think the German sociologist, Erwin uh, uh, Goffman, talks about um, tie signs. So they are the signs, or the gestures in a conversation, which um, I use to signify that my conversation with you is important. You know, eye contact or body language. Um, but that has evolved in a world before the mobile. So now we have to evolve different tie signs because um, I might get an incoming call in the course of our conversation. So different societies, different communities are evolving different <laughs> tie signs which enable me to say, look, I value our conversation, but I also got this, I've got an incoming call. Um, that's, that's just one example. Um, another example might be what some sociologists have called um, enforced eavesdropping. Um, and that's the situation where you're sitting next to someone on a bus or a train and they are having a domestic argument. You know, they're getting divorced and you can hear half the conversation and you don't want to. And I guess this is, this is very culturally specific because the, what the English have learned to do is um, hold their newspaper very emphatically. <laughs> so they, so, like that. And that signifies my attention is on, uh, my attention is on my newspaper, not on your divorce, um, or your domestic argument, or whatever. Um, but we clearly are kind of evolving different social practices and language is part of that. And um, these are very obviously very culturally specific. So maybe uh, in Germany it wouldn't be a newspaper. Uh, interestingly, I did some work with um, South African primary teachers, and it was about learning English. And it was, it was about, uh, we did a focus group with some yeah, primary teachers in Pretoria. And, and we said, we'd like to set up a system for, to help you support English. Uh, but the system is not perfect. And we're very sorry, you might get some spam. And they said, what is spam? And we said, well, it's just kind of garbage messages. You know, people wanting to sell you washing machines. And they said, no, spam is good. We want lots of spam. So, different cultures. Um, and maybe another part, another very specific um, example of the way in which communications practices have evolved is what in some parts of the world are called missed calls. So, for example, my, my first missed calls about under 15 years ago, when a taxi arrived for me and phoned my mobile. So I answered the mobile, and he says, I'm downstairs. I go downstairs, and he says, you're not supposed to answer that. That just cost me 10p. <laughs> you're so, it, yeah, it's a way of transmitting information without paying for the connection. But uh, in many different parts of the world, those missed calls convey different types of information. So in um, uh, the Punjab, they're very specific about kind of family, affection, and intimacy. Um, in many parts of the world, they are not called a missed call, they are called a please call me. Because actually, the person rings off before you get a chance to answer the phone because they want you to phone them, and you pay, they don't pay. 
Um, but in, in South Africa, this became so popular, and clearly the, the networks are making no money. And actually, missed calls were the largest proportion of the traffic. The majority of traffic on the South African phone networks consisted of missed calls, uh, or of please call me's. So the, the network said, five missed calls in one day and we cut you off. So, you, so there's a kind of constant dynamic between the people who want to make money from us and us not wanting to make them, not wanting to give them the money, but it's all about language and communication. Um, there is, uh, and there's lots of examples like this, but for example, early, res uh, early research, which is no doubt out of date, um, uh, looked at mobile phones in restaurants uh, or cafes, and how in different societies you can see the influence of hierarchy. If I'm important, I can have my phone on the table. If I'm not important, I can't have my phone on the table. I mean, these are informal and, and understood. Um, uh, men can have their phones on the table, maybe women not. Um, uh, you can have your phone on a table in a cafe, but not in a restaurant, and so on. Uh, but again, this is part of language and, and communication. Uh, and there's lots of it, sorry, there is lots of it. Um, and there's also quite a lot of work looking at how communities and spaces are being pushed and pulled. So if you, if you took an earlier example of, um, it's called the day extender syndrome, the fact that we are permanently connected and our bosses and our colleagues and our students can contact us when we're in our office, now when we're in our home, and now when we're on vacation, and now in the evening. So you see, that professional community or that work community pressing our private space. Um, but you can also see that private space pressing back. Uh, there's a paper, it's quite old, called No Dead Air. We can now take our music and our video wherever we are. We can take our private space with us wherever we are. Um, and there's also quite a lot of work looking at what mobile connectedness does to our sense of time. Uh, I mean, there's an argument that says that um, punctuality was created by Swiss uh, Calvinists <laughs> uh, in the 17th century. It's it, uh, punctuality and godliness. Um, and, you, and you could also argue, sorry if I sound like a Marxist, <coughs> Um, that it then underpinned Protestantism and the rise of capitalism and the factory system because you need people to be on time. Um, but actually, the and, and I've seen um, articles which talk about the wristwatch as being handcuffs, that they handcuff you to GMT, to Greenwich Mean Time, um, to the world of systems and factories. And actually, the mobile phone is not the handcuffs that connect you to uh, the factory system or the university's schedule or uh, anything like that. They, um, they mean that time is now personal. So I had the experience in uh, Nairobi of being late for a meeting. Uh, so I can phone ahead, so someone says, ah, I've got five minutes, I can reschedule my meeting. So someone else says, and you can see this going around the city, everyone is saying, ah, I've got another five minutes. Uh, or you come here and I'll go there. The time is no longer rigid. Um, uh, sorry, a friend of mine, Rich Ling, talks about um, socially negotiated time. You, you don't have to stick to Greenwich Mean Time or Central European Time because you're in contact with everyone. I think he talks about um, micro-coordination, for example. Um, you know, the fact that you can, as you get nearer to an event, you can start making adjustments because you can communicate with everyone involved. And I guess there's other examples about how the technology is making time go a bit weird. Um, I grew up in an age where we had only one TV channel, and, or no, two maybe, 
and every Thursday evening we would all watch Monty Python. Um, and we and we come to school and then everyone would talk about Monty Python. Um, but nowadays, of course, we have multiple digital channels. Um, we have the kind of time shifting that we can watch Monty Python now, later, anytime. Um, um, and we also have more international travel and connectedness. So I'm not only conscious of my time here, but the time of my colleagues in Melbourne or an editor in Singapore, plus uh, a colleague, co-writer in South Carolina. And I'm thinking, they're just getting up, they're going to bed. Um, my wife's just having lunch. So again, they, it becomes very smeared or, or plastic. Um, and someone, uh, again, Rich Ling talks about everyone in Norway 20 years ago would sit down and watch the 9 o'clock news. Now they don't. Um, because they're all watching things at different times, time shifted, digital, multiple modes, Facebook. And he talks about the loss of ontological security. Kind of no one has that sense of being in a physical community because there's just too many different factors, too many different influences. And so there's an argument that it's almost like um, cyberspace is a different country. Um, uh, people have pointed out that um, Facebook is the third largest country in the world. <laughs> and they've also pointed out that Apple has an economy that's bigger than Poland. Um, but it doesn't have an army yet. Um, and so I suppose if you're, if you're saying that cyberspace or phone space creates opportunities, uh, creates communities, places where people meet because of shared values and common interests, it's also places where people meet to talk about things, and they can't talk about things without language, but within those separate communities in cyberspace or in Facebook, clearly languages evolve um, separately and unique from how people use language and gesture uh, and conversation in physical conversation. Uh, and there's also an argument that it's changing our sense of identity, not only of community, but identity. This is a, a, a newspaper article from The Guardian where a young girl says uh, she would rather lose her kidneys than her mobile phone. Um, so if you look at I don't know, educational policies that say no phones in the classroom, that's not the same as saying no laptops in the classroom. That's like saying no kidneys in the classroom. Um, you know, we have to recognise and make adjustments, for example, to the kind of etiquette in the classroom, uh, because that's what these things mean to people. Um, oh, this was a, a Swiss invention that is um, radiation-proof underpants. Someone showed it to me a few years ago. Um, it's actually, uh, people in Nokia were saying that um, everyone has a mobile, uh, everyone values their mobile, they're unique to each of us, these are our new private parts. <laughs> Maybe that doesn't translate very well. <laughs> um, and a different example about identity and language and names is this, which is um, a, um, something I heard on the radio in South Africa um, that was pointing out that Ever since mobile phone services came to uh, KwaZulu-Natal, the names that children were being given suddenly become hands-free, contract, please call me, pay as you go, prepaid, ringtone, phone book, SMS, message, cell phone, uh, talk time, scratch card. So clearly there is a lot going on to do with mobile technology, personal identity, and language, um, and obviously different communities have different understandings of naming. Um, but nevertheless, these names that these children were being given are not Manchester United, or General Motors, or Rolls Royce. Uh, they are all around internet, server, airtime, uh, sim rejected, uh, and so on. So. This is going to be 
um, wider context, if you like, um, of language and language learning. And as I say here, um, it, I would argue it's learning, but it's not learning as recognized within our systems, our professions, and our institutions. Um, and this was supposed to be an example of citizen journalism, which, which I guess gives you a kind of political dimension to um, this as well. You know, where people are, can not only produce learning and information and ideas, but also can produce uh, uh, news and journalism. So there's a, a kind of wider argument about how it changes the dynamics within our society. Uh, and this is a, a different example of that, the, the conversations about <laughs> surveillance. Um, the, the English, or maybe the British, the English apparently have their images captured on CCTV 300 times a day. Um, um, and Oh. Okay. Five, five minutes. Okay. So we'll be this is the last couple. Um, there's a slightly philosophical, slightly wacky argument that, that the society that I'm describing is the end of modernity, the end of the values generated by the French Enlightenment. Um, the values that say, I don't know, science, education, um, our progress, um, that uh, cause and effect are easy to understand, uh, that right and wrong are easy to understand, that, I mean, crucially for you, that language is a way of describing and understanding reality, an imperfect one, maths is much better, um, but nevertheless, language is a way of uh, understanding and communicating about reality. Um, and this particular perspective is giving way to ideas about post-modernity. This, incidentally, is the clock tower in Brighton, which someone pointed out encapsulates the ideas of modernity. Um, there is a clock at the top symbolising punctuality. There is the royal family the Victorian royal family, around the bottom, symbolising hierarchy and the social order. And there are public toilets down below, symbolising um, hygiene. Um, and that these values um, and principles are giving way to post-modernity, uh, or surrealism possibly, where um, Cause and effect are really difficult to untangle. They're a mess where um, uh, right and wrong are also a mess. Everything is so complicated and everything is so changeable. But again, crucially, where actually, if you believe post-structuralist, language is not a way of understanding reality. Language is a way of constructing reality. Um, uh, Reality is not something passive uh, and uh, other that language is then able to describe for us. It's still around. Um, yeah, so this um, portrays that transition. The idea that you could have good cop, bad cop is very modernist, if you like. A nice duality. Um, but as soon as you get postmodern cop, that's really difficult to, to understand and get your head around. Um, so again, I'm, I guess I'm kind of widening the context in which language and learning take place and interact. And I hope that was helpful. Or just disturbing, actually, maybe. <laughs> Jackson, thank you very much for your talk, for putting us onto the right track, as I guess, on our conference. It was not just telling a talk, but very enriching when I say that. So do you have any questions to be asked, either in English or in German? I hope you will. I hope it's understandable, so it's better to So, so, hello. 
Um, I'm, I'm gonna do this from uh, Punjab, like you said. <laughs> so there's not exactly a question, but something I'd like to add about the missed call phenomena you just described. Sometimes we give missed calls to tell our family members that we are missing them. So it's kind of an indication you can add it there. Okay, yeah. Thank you. But it's based on a common understanding. It is. When you do a missed call, they don't think your taxi is here. They <laughs> think you're missing them. That's yeah. So it has a meaning to it. Yes. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Weitere Fragen? No. How how do you believe? I'm, I'm from my name is Rodrigo. I'm from uh, Brazil, and um, how do you do you think that uh, technology could play a part on on helping um, learning like a foreign language, right? And um, so, and I know that you talked about that, but if you have something um, specific like the Duolingo, you, you mentioned many times, so. Um, uh, the part between the technology and the classroom with the teachers, and I'm I'm graduated in computer science, so uh, just to, to to know your point of view, please. Um, I think I'm just the wrong person to ask. <laughs> um, sorry, the experts are out there, not. Um, and I think there are clearly. Um, a, a chaotic uh, abundance of resources. Um, and I think there is certainly not one right answer because that would be saying there is only one type of learner in one type of context. Um, so I guess just listen to everyone else's talks in the course of the next two days and then you'll have the answer. That's what I'm sure. <laughs> okay, any further questions? Uh, how do you feel about the fact that a lot of information in the new, with new media is there's no really uh, peer review? So as academics, we're really interested in peer reviewed knowledge. And as language teachers, we of course try to impart uh, some kind of standard for our students to learn. And in these new media, a lot of that is missing, so there's no peer review. It's too democratic. Uh, how do you feel about that and the future of that for teaching foreign languages? Ooh, um, that, there's, there's quite a few different directions I could I could go with that. Um, I mean, for example, um, what I think is portrayed as um, the professional and objective activity of assessing the value of an academic paper, um, and therefore the gold standard for writing and research could easily be portrayed as something that embodies the values of uh, white European academics uh, and white, probably male academics actually as well. Um, I'm, I'm, so, uh, for example, when I work in Africa, I'm very conscious that most of the stuff written about Africa is written by white people and is read by white people uh, outside Africa. So I hesitate to see it uncritically or unconditionally as a gold standard. Um, I suppose also, certainly in the UK, we're seeing open access publication. And again, that seems to be benign because it says everyone can read everything. But it also means the publishers don't have a business model anymore. If they're not making money from the readers, they need to make money from the writers. Um, and that might mean that in some cases, um, affluent universities can pay, um, pay subscriptions on behalf of their academic writers, but it also means less affluent universities can't. So it means that affluent researchers in affluent universities are getting published, whilst uh, those in less affluent universities are not. Uh, I mean, and you can make that argument at a university level. You can also make that argument uh, in terms of uh, at a 
national level and say that um, you can have a, you can have a good idea and good, do a good piece of research in Cameroon in English and it won't get published because you don't know how it works, you don't know the routine, you don't know the standards, you don't know the expectation, you're not in the network and you can write exactly the same piece of research in the UK and it will get, it will get published even though apparently the same, you know, you'd argue it's the same objective standards. Um, if you then look at that, oh sorry, I suppose an open access seems to have also led to the rise of predatory journals. I mean, if the publishers don't have a, if the publisher's business model now involves the writers, not the readers, that means you can pay to get published. It becomes vanity publishing. So that means you've got established journals going over to the, um, I think it's called ACP or APC, author pays costs or something like that, going over to that model because they're good, they're good authoritative journals but they need to stay in business. But you can also then get hundreds and thousands of bad journals which will just take your money and publish anything. You know, there are examples of people using a kind of automatic garbage journal generator and they get they get the article published because they pay $500. Um, and I think the, the argument, um, I suppose there's also the, the argument about language. Um, I think in Germany, for example, there's pressure to publish in English because high status journals are English. And if you want to go up global rankings, you need to get into those high impact journals. Therefore, you need to do it in English. Um, so again, it's not like if you had a good idea in German and if you had a good idea in English, the English one gets published because there is institutional pressure. But if it's a good idea in German, you'll have to translate it first. Um, so again, it's not as kind of country neutral, language neutral, culture neutral as it seems. And then there is a separate kind of argument about uh, Wikipedia. Uh, and I, I heard a story which was uh, a postgraduate uh, seminar, um, uh, an old, maybe an old fashioned traditional lecturer was saying, peer reviewed journals, that's where the truth is. Look at Wikipedia, and, and we're now looking at a paper, paper published yesterday, Wikipedia is wrong, Wikipedia is out of date. Next day, student comes along and says, look, I've updated Wikipedia. <laughs> um, you know, and I think the demographics of Wikipedia is that it's actually probably American postgraduates who are doing most of the um, editing and the reviewing anyway. So it becomes a kind of proxy for um, uh, academic activity or for, for conventional academic activity. Anyway, although of course, um, again, Wikipedia is not culturally neutral. Apparently there is more there is more text in Wikipedia on Middle Earth than there is on the whole of Africa. Um, so. um, thank you very much. Any further questions? Yes, I have I have a final question because you made a statement which is utterly existential for us. You said uh, why do we still learn foreign languages? So are you Rather pessimistic or optimistic about us as language learners, instructors, attractors, and also language researchers? No, not at all. Um, I think I was just arguing that it's very easy to sell the mechanics of language learning and then to find that the mechanics of language learning have been digitized and outsourced. Um, and I guess it's very easy to have a kind of formal commercial model or institutional model around that. And I guess that is also very uh, testable. Um, and and uh, our kind of neoliberal market universities are very, you know, we're very keen on tests and we're also very keen on industrialization. Um, but actually my argument was that it's the social context uh, that constitutes the real language, it's, you know, it's people, it's um, fluidity, informality, change and flux that constitute language, not just dictionaries that get put onto computers. Thank you very much, so let's continue going for it.
teaching languages and learning further languages, even if it's not always read, perhaps, which is really a challenge, which I can imagine. Thank you very much. Okay. It was very nice and instructive listening to you. So we're now having our lunch break. We would have to continue.